3,000 people got saved on the day of Pentecost after Peter preached. And then shortly thereafter, Peter, and I think it was John, was it, healed a lame man. And then the crowd that gathered after that, because he had been lame from like his birth or something, all the people that gathered at that point, Peter again preached to them, and 5,000 people got saved. So there's 8,000 people that got saved in a short amount of time. We look at that and we think, good night, that's, that's a lot of people. And glory to God that that happened. But there was one preacher one time um, in the past who had opportunity to preach to tens and tens of thousands of people, and he preached to them. But then after they actually repented of their sins, he had a rotten attitude. And you may know who I'm talking about. It was none other than Jonah, the son of uh, Amittai. And that's who we'll be talking about for the next few minutes. If you go and turn there to the book of Jonah, and we'll see something about the attitude that Jonah had and how it often comes into our lives. And some questions we need to ask pertaining to that. Jonah chapter 3 at the very end, we'll actually start in verse 10. Jonah at this point had already preached. You know, he was swallowed up by the great fish. uh, And he had a change of attitude at that point. And then preached to Nineveh. And they actually repented. They fasted and put on sackcloth. And and God saw that. And in verse 10 of chapter 3 it says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, um, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live." We see the opportunity Jonah had, what opportunity it was. If you go down to the bottom of the book, uh, verse 11, apparently there's six score thousand persons that can't discern between their right hand and their left. That would obviously be children that would not be able to make that discernment. So we have 120,000 young children in a city. That tells you how many people are actually adults in a city. What an opportunity to preach. And we know that they... The majority, if not all of them, repented in chapter 3 and verse 5. It says, The people of Nineveh believed God, at the end, from the greatest of them even to the least of them. And even the king got in on this. What an opportunity, what a chance for a preacher to preach the message of repentance from a gracious God. But yet he had a rotten attitude. What's up with that? And... You see there in verse, uh, uh, verse 1 of chapter 4, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He was very angry, it says. And then in verse 2, he praised God and, and is basically uh, accusing God of something that God had done. How messed up is that? In verse 3, he wants to die rather than live and see these people uh, live in repentance and a new life for them. He'd rather die then see these things progress. And then when God asks him a question to rebuke him, he says, doest thou well to be angry? And he doesn't even answer. He just goes off outside the city and pouts. Mm -hmm. He made him a booth and sits and hoping, I'm guessing, hoping, waiting, maybe some chance that God will still judge Nineveh and he will be able to watch it. How sad. In verse 6, God made a gourd And it delivered him from his grief, no doubt physical grief from the sun being in the desert, but no doubt also emotional grief as he didn't get what he wanted. What he wanted was Nineveh to be destroyed, and that didn't happen. We see his attitude. He was a stubborn man. He was full of grief. He wanted death and all these things. We ask the question, why? Why Why did this happen? And some have surmised, and maybe it was because Nineveh was an enemy of Israel, Uh, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. And being the enemy, of course, they wouldn't want their enemy to do anything good. They wouldn't want them to to be right, especially with God. We want the enemies to be judged. And even today, we realize this 
in po politics. We want our enemies of the United States subdued, do we not? Well, no matter where they are in the world, people that would come to us, terrorists, no matter what they may be, we want them under control. We want them subdued. And no doubt uh, there is a possibility that this is happening in Jonah's mind. They were their enemies. We don't want our enemies to repent. I wonder if there's any people like that in our, in our thinking, in our mind, people that we would actually not want to experience the grace of God. You talk about prejudice. There's prejudice in the world, racial problems even. May that not come between us and our desire to see people come to Christ. Amen. But <clears throat> if you turn back to 2 Kings chapter 14, this is the other passage of Scripture that talks about Jonah, mentions him in 2 Kings 14. And maybe there's something else going on. says here in verse 23, In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned forty and one years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering in of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet which was of gath -hefer. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter, for there was not any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper for Israel. And the Lord said not that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, but he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. Now these are some dark days in the land of Israel. The king of Israel this time was a wicked king. He says, departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, who was the first king when the nations had split. He plunged the nation of Israel, which was north, into idolatry. And he, this man, Jeroboam, number two, you might say, did not depart from these sins. It was a very dark day. And part of me wonders if uh, Jonah, the prophet at this time, is looking at his very own people, looking at his very own uh, nation, and seeing how they have wholeheartedly plunged into sin and have not repented and he, a prophet to these people, wants greatly to see these people repent. But instead, God sends him to Nineveh. That doesn't seem fair. I mean, you have your heart with these people. These people you think about all the time. You want these people, your people, your nation, your family to repent. But instead, you see heathen people that uh, idolatry and, and wickedness they repent. That doesn't seem fair. Maybe this was part of what was going on in his mind. I do not know, actually. If we go back to Jonah, the book of Jonah, it doesn't explicitly say what the problem was, why he was angry. It just says he was angry. But he had an attitude problem based on what God had, did, uh, had done. So then God comes to him and says, Doest thou well to be angry? Basically he's saying, look, this is a time of rejoicing. This is, a, this is a wonderful time in history. Nineveh, no doubt tens of thousands of people have repented. This is a time of rejoicing in what I have done. And you're here pouting and angry and exceedingly displeased. This is not right. He says, Doest thou well to be angry? And then, of course, um, Jonah didn't get the point. He still wanted to remain with that attitude. He didn't want to repent at that time, so he goes outside the city. God prepares a gourd, a plant, to rise up and protect him from the heat and from the sun. And it says in, at the end of verse 6, So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. How about that? He gets so excited about such a stupid thing like a gourd, and he gets so displeased over the repentance of a multitude of people. That's backwards. That's not the way it should be. And God uses this gourd to show, or to try to show, we don't know, Jonah got it figured out. We never, I guess, got the end of the story. But 
God was using this gourd to try to show Jonah, you've got a problem, a heart problem, uh, a priority problem. God wanted Jonah to repent and what he had done. And I say, now what does this mean for us today? Well, I wonder what our attitude is toward the workings of God in our midst. Do we, uh, do we get excited? Are we pleased or are we displeased? Are we jealous over things or are we, are we just flat out excited at what God's doing? Do we have a sincere desire to see God um, progress his kingdom in this earth at this time? Or are there perhaps selfish motivations going on in our life? Notice in verse 2, Jonah, he tells us something about who God is. He says, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before in a Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. This is the God that we serve. He's a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. We can rejoice in this. That God, who has changed our lives, wants to change other people's lives. And we can actually be a part of that. Get out of town. We can actually be a part of what God's doing. And we can actually have a good attitude about it, too. We can get excited about what God is doing in our lives and in the lives of other people around us. So I wonder what your attitude is. I wonder what, um, like Jonah, was more concerned about this gourd than he was about the souls of men. I wonder if there are any physical things in your life that you put more value on than on the souls of men. And boy, I tell you, this hits home, doesn't it? When the, you know you ask the question, what gets you excited? You know, well, there are things that get me excited, but do they get me as excited as it is to go witnessing and and to spread the gospel and do a Bible study with somebody? What really gets you excited? You know, we can compare ourselves with Jonah and say, oh, yeah, see, I'm not that bad. That's, you know, that's ridiculous. I mean, seriously. But are we all the way up here where God has his heart? Read the last two verses of the book. God says, and said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? Do you sense the heart of God in those two verses? Yes, he was bringing judgment, but he was doing that because he wanted, he actually wanted Nineveh to repent. He actually wanted them to turn around. And that message of judgment did it for them brought them to a point of seriousness and sobriety about their sin. Is that your heart? God's heart is a, is a heart of mercy. He wants to show kindness toward people. He wants to show mercy because he's gracious. Are you the same way? Or do you have a selfish attitude like Jonah? So I simply want to encourage you tonight, encourage all of us, this upcoming year, maybe we need a heart check, an attitude check, refocus on what really matters in life, what's really most important. And when God does something spectacular, even in our very midst, it's something we can get excited about, even eternally. God says that when a sinner repents, there's joy in the presence of the angels. Hey Amen. If, if God gets excited about that, I think we can get excited, you know? <laughs> Anyways. Amen. Amen.